Very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jiří Hošek. I am from uh, the TV Sesnam, and I'm uh, the chair of the first panel of this afternoon. A panel that, in my opinion, has a very nice title. EU, a matter of love or marriage of convenience. Uh, my personal marriage um, is uh, of the same age as is our presence in the European Union, more or less. Uh, and I can say that um, I'm lucky enough that uh, my relationship with my wife is still based on love. And this is something that I would also like uh, when it comes to the Czech Republic uh, part, uh, membership in the European Union. But it seems to be rather a bit more complicated. Before I invite the panelists to the podium, so let me stress one point. We do not want to have a, a very close discussion, um, something very closed and uh, not open, and that's why we welcome all your questions and comments. Uh, uh, well, I think that you know the system. Uh, for instance, uh, you may just pose your questions uh, uh, through uh, the uh, email address uh, that you see before you. And uh, I do hope that uh, if you use this opportunity, your question will be raised uh, also uh, by the panelists. I would like to welcome uh, the first uh, participant, um, namely the European Commissioner, Ms. Vera Jourova. Welcome. Please take the seat. Next, um, let me welcome uh, a colleague of mine from ECO24, Lemis Lenka Zlamalova. Very good afternoon. And uh, let us welcome Mr. Pavel Rychetsky, uh, the chairperson chairman of the Constitutional Court of the Czech Republic. Let's give in an applause as well. Very good afternoon. And last but not least, Mr. Martin Povechel, the former ambassador at the European Union, currently the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. A very good afternoon to you as well, sir. If I may, uh, let me strike an attack to you on you, Ms. Jourova. Is it possible to laugh uh, the European Union? Because Václav Havel said that uh, in his case, an appeal was uh, aimed at his uh, uh, reason rather than heart. Uh, very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am convinced that we may laugh and like the European Union as uh, a space we live in. Uh, there is no war within this space, and we just discuss and we arrive to compromises whenever we just uh, uh, discuss the important things. So it is a space, a room where we cooperate. We may see the cases that uh, the mayor of, uh, of uh, the city of Dechin enter into cooperation with his counterparts in Germany. And we may come up with many, many such examples. Uh, I don't know we, whether or not we may love the European Union as a set of institutions. Uh, uh, there is uh, a play of a um, natural instinct uh, um, that we are not uh, liking uh, institutions in general. But we could uh, discuss uh, Europe uh, um, in terms of having a uh, common space uh, within which we achieve something uh, really good and unique. Lenka Zlamalova, all of us, uh, uh, we were just uh, carefully following uh, the uh, uh, situation in the UK, various campaigns. Uh, well, uh, we, we could see that uh, the EU supporters uh, did, did not manage uh, to instigate this into the people in the UK. In case that something like that uh, happens in the Czech Republic and you would be the person responsible for a campaign uh, supporting the EU, what would you do and what would work the best? I think that it cannot be 
realistically thinkable that something like that uh, could help in this country. And what is happening in the UK is uh, not helping the EU. Uh, our position is completely different than that of the European of the United Kingdom, and uh, therefore I have never was thinking about it because uh, I've never noticed um, similar moods and thinking uh, in this country. Uh, I think that it would be very productive uh, to think about it uh, only positively. If I am an Italian, so perhaps, uh, perhaps uh, it would be a different case, but in the Czech Republic, uh, uh, we should uh, not uh, think about it because we want to discuss uh, rational things, uh, things uh, that are relevant. Uh, uh, the quitting of the Czech Republic uh, of the European Union, nobody wants it in this country. And back in 2016, uh, the pro EU camp uh, just uh, had posters printed uh, uh, with the slogan, uh, we like EU, but uh, um, nobody wanted to use it as a sticker to their cars, etc. Why? Because uh, you posed a question to uh, Madam Commissioner whether or not it is possible to like uh, the EU, and she just gave us the right answer. But you see, to reflect uh, uh, very in a emotion as love can be seen, so it is uh, not appropriate, so it is uh, not within this way, and that's why the British Be Britons uh, responded in this way. Uh, the referendum outcome was as it was, uh, and uh, they just had uh, pros and cons, uh, and uh, the posters and stickers, it was somewhat uh, out of the place. Uh, probably the approach should have been different, uh, it should have been more positive, more rational. Let's keep the topic of uh, uh, UK referendum or Brexit uh, um, aside, and let's come back to this country. After the collapse of communism, we wanted to become the EU member country, member of the NATO. And uh, Mr. Rychetsky, you also used to be a politician. Uh, you were a member of the uh, socialist government. Uh, well, do you feel to be co-responsible for succeeding our EU mem membership? Uh, and uh, probably we should have uh, stressed this uh, membership more. Uh, first, I was part of the federal uh, and later on Czech government. Uh, and I also was involved in politics uh, during the pre-accession talks. Uh, and I can say only that it was nothing easy. But uh, no problem when it comes uh, to absence of will in terms of being part of uh, the European Union. In fact, um, an issue that we were feeling was uh, how we could um, uh, fulfill the joint uh, common values and requirements uh, that uh, the EU is based on or has been based on in those days. I have a small memory. In that government, I was to organize uh, the harmonization of the body of law in those days, uh, which uh, reflected to the hundreds of thousands of pages uh, uh, that were created and drafted uh, many years before our accession to the EU. In those days, uh, a sort of envoy of uh, uh, the European communities uh, was the person of Ramino Ciprian. Once I just uh, had a dinner with him, and uh, I have left a number of uh, situations when many other commissioners came here and uh, uh, tested by us. I told him, uh, in those days, uh, I had a daughter of nearly 18, and she has uh, several animals uh, at home, but she's not yet uh, in love with a boy. Oh, she was not in those days. And uh, we have to prepare ourselves for her saying, uh, dear parents, um, I want to marry, to get married. And all of a sudden, we will ask about her fiancé. Uh, what is the background of his family? What is his education? Does he fit fit into our family? And you, dear Commissioner, this is how you are testing us uh, for many years. 
check us, uh, verify uh, our status. Uh, I am a Europhile, and I think uh, our EU accession is uh, a success. So I have to admit at the same time that in those days, uh, each and every candidate country uh, was approached in a different way. And um, I also asked several uh, top European politicians a uh, private question, namely, uh, what are you going to do, for instance, in case of Poland uh, that did not meet uh, the accession uh, requirements? So will you postpone this country's accession? And obviously, uh, politics uh, prevailed. It is interesting to say that uh, this high standard uh, this hard benchmark that we had to surpass uh, started to be lowered uh, later on when further ex um, uh, accession uh, period started. And today we are witnessing a situation that uh, the common spirit of the European Union starts to be somehow uh, avoided. And this is uh, somewhat nocive, and it is an unhappy situation. And the present question whether this is a matter of love or a marriage of convenience is somewhat uh, somehow irrelevant, because it is always a marriage of convenience. And in some cases, we add the love. Love not for the European Commission, but uh, a love for Europe. Well, the first motto, and uh, we are not that old, uh, majority of us, uh, was uh, let's get back to Europe, let's return to Europe. And uh, this is why we should really do our utmost uh, that the Czech Republic is uh, belonging to those countries uh, of the EU that uh, will support uh, a new wave of renaissance, uh, uh, showing that Europe belongs to us, uh, that we are not a troublemaker country, a country that is only doing problems. I will now pose a question to Mr. Poveshal. Isn't it a blunder or major mistake that we talk uh, about the European, about uh, them or they? It should be us, rather, when we refer there to. And we should cherish uh, the space we live in, that is this uh, grouping. I believe it is a an essential mistake, and you will never hear from me uh, talking about them or and us here. But uh, I believe it clearly illustrates uh, what uh, we have heard in the video recording uh, by of Mr. Havel when he had referred to identity and other things. And when, you know, sort of observing or looking at the Czech society and listening to them, we frequently don't know as yet who we are, where we belong, or we don't simply ad admit all that things approach us. So, and this differentiation between them and us is uh, truly all wrong. I believe it is uh, the outcome of the fact that 15, one, five, 15 years ago, and Mrs. Kovacqua mentioned that, I believe, that we only start to understand what the European Union actually means, how it works, what the architecture of this community is like. Uh, did I, oh, Blanka Slamalwa was uh, nodding her head or not? I, I quite agree with what Mr. Povesher had said. I guess uh, each and every, uh, so to say, self-confident country will contribute to the shape or future developments of the union. That means we shall not merely blindly follow and accept 
any and every proposal, uh, packed or wrapped in uh, the flag of EU, but will be involved uh, ourselves. Isn't this also due to the fact that the media lag behind the equality coverage of EU events and things? One thing I um, was impressed by Renaissance renaissance that's I guess the climax on the best time that Europe has ever gone through the most successful period or period of thriving Europe and it actually it was not based also on individual actors uh, competing, I mean, getting ideas, sharing them, but many cruel um, activities were, or many cruelties occurred as well, sure, but it's always like that. Uh, whenever there is a free competition uh, and, um, and there is no equality, no equalization, then it profits or it benefits actually everyone. So I believe that we should have a debate in that spirit. Now, Mrs. Yorova, don't you think that uh, not only in the Czech Republic things are reduced uh, to matters of finance, like we distinguish between the net? beneficiaries and net payers, isn't it uh, rather like that? And the word which Mr. Havel used, that is values, that was in the video recording, isn't it so that the values that Europe was uh, based on when being established are kind of being neglected? Thank you for the floor. Renaissance. Well, I do those uh, stepping minds or mind simply Mr. Rikitsky knows what I'm talking about or what I'm referring to, things that are actually associated with values. I oftentimes uh, think of Mr. Sabrina, who had, I mean, bright eyes and was capable of already to burn books and also people, of course. The and I wish we can more effectively or more rationally fight uh, again, oh, fight fanatism, whatever uh, side it comes from. Simply, we don't want to be overcome and overrun by fanatism. But back to your question, yes, I do have the feeling that things uh, really boil down to economy-related matters only. I could give you positive uh, statistical returns of uh, related to the Czech Republic, saying how well we are doing or how the living standard has gone up. But if we only talk about the benefits and gains and we neglect or skip the uh, cons or more abstract things, which may in some cases be extremely important, uh, while well, that would be a mistake. So we, yes, we have to talk about European values, but also about the values which Europe, so to say, maintains or upkeeps like a family, a love for your homeland, your own space or surrounding. All that is what Mr. Havel had in mind when saying if we exceed to the union because of the money only, let's um, prevent uh, exceeding to let's not do it. I remember him saying so in Strasbourg because the values are just as important as the other values, of course. And those values, whether you label them European values or just values, well, those are things very difficult to explain to people. It is far easier, more simple to explain explain the things about uh, economic gains or benefits. And if, uh, rule of law is, of course, essential, as Mr. Rychetsky says, and we should also uh, contemplate the way to explain such things, since um, people, don't, if things change uh, along that abstract level, people will not feel it immediately in their own uh, location or place, but it shouldn't be simply neglect or forgotten. Well, the topic of this is the matter of love uh, or a marriage of convenience. Well, those values, that's part of the love and the rest. That's the marriage of convenience. And I myself can't see any tension 
I mean, I don't feel it personally. I mean, the tension between values and practical aspects, or between the love and marriage of convenience. Well, you have spent many years in the Brussels. Do you remember your feelings? When you compare your feelings when you first arrived there and when you got back here, well, I was lucky enough. I was both in the Alliance and the European Union, so that was uh, truly good for me. In the NATO, well, um, I have uh, not left. I did not join and haven't left either as the supporter of the European Union. I simply have had a clearer idea as of the very beginning. So would you send questions? We got a wonderful question from Andre Erbel. Thank you for that. When, uh, when the European uh, co uh, Commission is pretty uh, sort of strong, then we usually complain about uh, them being too tough, etc. Well, you know, I hear both, of course. How come someone in the EU doesn't bang the table and uh, says uh, clearly things about what to do when it comes to migration, your quality of food? We have heard a reference uh, to your hint in the song sung before. And there are also things when the commission is, or oh, it's not the commission who should be blamed because the commission uh, has no last say in the legislature process. That's the parliament, you know, and the member states, as a matter of fact, and not the commission. But we are always criticized for being too weak or addressing, uh, so to say, red herrings or silly things which are not that important. And we are also criticized for interfering um, with people's lives, etc. But I'm happy to say that I live in Europe where uh, there is no one fist or person who would actually bang the table and say, well, this is the way it is going to be, and that's it. Angela Merkel said that uh, the Council or European Council should um, be convened far more often, which is what I fully support. It wouldn't be one person's fist only, but the um, statesmen who would be responsible also for explanation of things and informing people back at home. But um, we don't uh, like uh, the situation when legislation adopted or the pieces of legislation adopted in the past actually impact us now. Until 2014, the European Union has uh, dealt with many, I wouldn't call it cosmetic uh, sort of touches, but, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, standards, technical norms have been amended and changed. And then uh, the Ukraine micro migration Brexit, terrorism, all these uh, crises, all these aspects, or, or, all these things occurred, and people started to believe that uh, European Union has been dealing with marginal things rather than the most important or serious things. But the Commission, I'm a member of the Commission, tried or has always tried to deal with important things, but we should not merely state that or keep stating that we should to, to a kind of a stock take once we have the new parliament, and then we should do perhaps less, but uh, more perfect or better, in a better way, in order to delete or remove things which we don't have to tackle together. To Mrs. Lamelov and Mr. Brzezinski, the following questions. Well, we oftentimes complain of uh, having been understood or taken as a second uh, quality or uh, country, uh, quality of food, etc. Then uh, Slovak, I mean, if you take the elections, we were the uh, second from the bottom. I want wonder what will the outcome of this uh, MEP election be this week. We should perhaps be more self-confident. We should also pursue more visible EU policy in order to be stronger than Visegrad 4 because, um, you know, Brussels 
perceives us in this manner. Oftentimes, Mr. Rikensky, well, on the one hand, we have to admit that um, there are two categories. So there are simply two categories of EU member states. There's the Eurozone and the countries which Oh, that is the Eurozone uh, countries which have the common or single currency. And when you ask what to do to be in the better, better part or better group zone, well, the answer is pretty simple. We can end with the Slovaks, uh, the introduction of Euro or adoption rather of Euro. And I feel very so right simply uh, regret that our export oriented countries, which 70 or 75 percent of trade exchange is traded in Euro only, that our country had no courage to adopt the Euro. That's one thing. And the other thing, uh, yes, as being a simple lawyer, I dare say that the community law system uh, agree uh, simply uh, 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 is far from being well developed. Each and every civilized country has first uh, drawn up uh, the uh, legal regulations and then codified that, but uh, the European law is still very fragmented, uh, whether it concerns uh, free movement of goods and persons, uh, where we should, due to that, also have a common code of conduct in trade and not individual standards or pieces of legislation which frequently simply mix apples and pears, pears and apples. And I know what's behind it. I know what the reason is. And that is the, or this reason is simply something we not only must um, accept, uh, but uh, we have to honor it or respect it, which uh, is democracy, simply democracy. Each and every such uh, piece of legislation or standard must be the outcome of an intensive discussion of 28 entities in this case. And it is always a trade-off or compromise, but that's democracy. And we live in democracy, that's for sure. Some people, uh, some demagogues, I mean, um, uh, complaining, saying it's uh, bureaucracy, etc. But it's common will. It's the outcome of common will can't be helped. Such it is. And you are right that we should do something not to be only put into one group of uh, Visegrad for with Poland and Hungary where the development is uh, truly malicious or uh, malignant, so to say, and I believe it's going to be the European Union, which will try uh, the, to move or bring back the trajectory on which these countries embarked back to the common European principles. Thank you very much. Uh, Eurozone is a project uh, uh, that will uh, be here uh, for several years, uh, but it is not sustainable for a longer period. Uh, Anne-Marie, the French minister, said that uh, we, it is just uh, 5 to 12 before a crisis uh, may, might start. And unless we do something, uh, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, sharing the debts, for instance, so Europe will not survive. And uh, we, I do agree with it. I don't want to speak uh, uh, about the Eurozone because uh, uh, it is a topic for a uh, uh, whole conference uh, because um, uh, there are various uh, expert texts uh, showing and proving uh, that uh, it is uh, something that uh, should develop uh, further. And uh, the, the constitutional, Mr. Rechetsky spoke about it. Uh, and um, now, as for the uh, secondary position of the Czech Republic in the EU, first, uh, position of a country is very much about uh, the type of the country. If we are uh, 
top country, well-functioning, civilized, uh, rich country. Uh, well, this is also how others may treat us and see us. Uh, and this is something that we have to do with uh, today uh, at home. Uh, nobody can do that for us. Uh, for instance, um, there are some inspirational countries uh, of uh, the similar size, um, uh, be it the Denmark, uh, the Netherlands, etc. Are these country, um, when they want to promote their interests, uh, uh, are looking for various variable coalitions. And this is exactly how the Czech Republic should uh, approach this. Uh, well, let's take uh, some projects, for instance, energy uh, sphere. Uh, for us, France uh, may be a typical partner when it comes to the free trade, for instance, uh, when it comes to um, uh, um, rejecting uh, certain uh, processes. Uh, well, uh, as Mr. Grichetsky put it, uh, it's about uh, uh, free trade with some countries, for instance, uh, free trade uh, with Germany in the energy sector. Visegrad for it, though, so that's also a media short Cut. Uh, it's very much about our ability to form uh, certain coalitions, uh, and we should be self-confident to an extent uh, that we may defend certain topics, uh, as was the case, for instance, uh, the uh, quitting of the EU uh, by the United Kingdom. Uh, well, we are just behaving as a herd. We were not able to change things. Uh, I talked about it with uh, the UK ambassador about this topic. Uh, I asked him whether something was done by the, on the side by the Czech uh, institutions. Uh, and then Mr. Babish is astonished uh, when uh, he reads about his meeting with Anne Labbe, um, uh, who claims that uh, Macron just dared to say something at the European Council. But you see there, they proceed in a unanimous way, and we never protected our interests there. Well, let's uh, continue with the audience uh, questions. Uh, would you be just to mention at least one argument why the younger people should uh, come to uh, this week elections? Uh, what are we to decide about and what can we influence by just going to that election? As uh, mentioned before, the parliament uh, uh, or oh, elections as such, uh, it's my civic civil right, uh, but it's my ob also duty. And when it comes to the European Union, I do not accept uh, uh, the division between us and them. Why? There is one particular reason to it. Um, if we feel it like that, if we want to feel it like that, so then uh, to go to the elections is the only possibility I have before me currently. Ms. Jorova, I think uh, that for young people, for the young generation, it's a good prospect. Uh, to, they, they may stay in Europe uh, with a good prospect, uh, with the possibility to live in a stable environment, uh, environment that also opens space for creativity, innovation, personal career development. Uh, um, you see, these values offered by the EU are very important, especially for the young people. And you mentioned it in the beginning, that sometimes we take it as something automatic, um, having this uh, common space. Uh, but if we want this to, to be available for the young people, so they should realize it uh, and they should work on it as well. It's a very good uh, option for the young people. Uh, uh, what might be the uh, participation in this uh, week election uh, participation rate, 26 percent. Oh, well, for me, I think that xenophobic people will not go to the election and that uh, the election will uh, outcome of the election will be positive because the young people see it as a future. They will live in Europe, uh, in Europe where they can study, they can travel, they may work uh, in vineyards or apple orchards, uh, or do you think that they want to be closed up uh, in a small xenophobic uh, society? I hope that uh, the participation rate will be higher than 20 percent, uh, and uh, 
it will reflect uh, the understanding of young people and how they understand Europe. Thank you. I think it will be similar to the previous elections. Uh, we have to see it in the entire context. Uh, 60% of uh, our participation in the Czech elections uh, is also lower uh, as against the average. Uh, for instance, in France, it is up to 80%. In Austria, uh, as for the Senate elections, 30% of people come and uh, 25 people in the second round. Uh, well, it's not about our being skeptic. Uh, uh, the highest election rate, or sorry, voting rate is uh, in the municipal elections. Uh, and it's not that abstract as in other types of elections. Uh, I think maximum 20%. And who will come to the election? Difficult to say. The participation rate will be slightly higher than in the past, uh, um, somewhat er above 20 percent, I, I guess. And there may be two good reasons to it. First, I would expect that uh, uh, the Brexit uh, situation, what is happening around it, uh, um, made uh, a, certain, uh, a lot of people uh, unquiet. Uh, and I think that 15 years uh, of our life within the EU shows something, that we have a new young generation, generation of people who, in the majority of cases, uh, uh, um, have been living uh, uh, within the EU, EU. and uh, they will not want to lose the opportunity to live there furthermore. Uh, another quite nice question that may be a probe to check uh, spirit. Uh, do you think that uh, if the promoting of the European Union is higher in the Czech Republic, uh, more people would go to the uh, EP uh, elections? Well, just a small comment uh, uh, to the young generation. We should see it within a context. Young people uh, have uh, the lowest possible participation rate uh, uh, in general. The, the elderly are most disciplined voters, uh, uh, and uh, uh, it is the same situation for the European elections. Uh, the young generation, 18, uh, up to 29 years of age uh, come to uh, the elections not that often. And I think that uh, um, too hard uh, promotion is not a good idea. Some, some soft approach would be nicer and more functional. I have seen some promotional spots uh, uh, made by the European Commission. And uh, I may tell you that uh, this will attract only the Europhobe uh, uh, voters. Uh, Mr. Brzobohati presence in one of them. So this is something uh, that should be rejected. Well, it very much depends uh, not only on how you do it, but who is doing it. I uh, am a supporter of a silent, soft promotion showing the successes. Uh, I don't like uh, the hard slogans, and I'm glad if I see that uh, the promotion, or rather disseminating the information, whenever captured by various institutions uh, and present uh, facts and figures. Uh, for instance, academia uh, is doing very well. The universities will want to increase the awareness, uh, this is what they claim. And in general, if the European institutions uh, are to perform certain promotion uh, for a particular country, so it shouldn't be in a format of one piece of uh, news uh, for everybody. Uh, well, I am in favor of uh, communication decentralization, decentralization, sorry, because and it should go via our representation offices uh, in individual countries, uh, because they know the best. Uh, they know how cer certain things work. And in this respect, we should do a lot, uh, much more. When it comes to the fact that um, the elderly are having the highest p uh, participation rate, uh, so let me say the following. Uh, uh, you see, 
whenever people approach me in in uh, the trams, for instance, so it's usually the elderly, not the young people. The the elderly really want to know more. They approach me and they ask me. The young people, however, uh, for good reasons, uh, should become more uh, in it. Should become more attentive. Election campaign. I haven't seen any uh, spots uh, by made by the EU or by the Czech Republic. But what I notice uh, clearly is uh, a spot claiming that we are going to defend uh, or fight for. But it was not said for whom or for what. Well, well, this is uh, something hidden there. Yes, you're right, but. Everyone is claiming we are going to defend our national interests. But nobody explained what we mean by our national interests. And it seems that practically everybody talks about a double quality of food. And it has nothing to do with the European Union, uh, the food that is coming into our country. So it's about the Czech inspectorate authority and our ministry, etc. And uh, there is another question to the Commissioner. How do you want to approach the double food quality? This is a question of Martin. I shop in Austria very often, and quality of foodstuffs is uh, completely different. Uh, and another question about uh, uh, big supermarkets. It has nothing to do with the European Union and Commission. We. Uh, we focus on uh, the big uh, supranationals uh, that uh, s supply seemingly the same foodstuffs, uh, but it, they are different. Uh, obviously, it's a cross-border matter, but uh, what must work here in this respect is the legislation. So a piece of legislation has been approved. We will see whether or not it will be reflected in the practice uh, and the awareness uh, on a certain different brands of products, uh, how this works. Uh, uh, so what we want is that the producers uh, give information about potential differences uh, within one and uh, similar product. Uh, and I would like to uh, produce a specific uh, technology that would read the differences in similar products uh, in the mode uh, corresponding to the 21st century. And then consumers. That's another very important point. If uh, consumers uh, think that uh, a certain detergent uh, is uh, not that quality, not, is not having that quality, so they should say so. Uh, well, a number of consumers understand this, uh, and they want uh, that something is uh, to be changed, uh, and you, you have to use various paths. Uh, and regulation top-down is the only option we have before us. And checks and inspections, as Mr. Rychensky said. We propose the new legislation because inspection authorities said uh, that uh, the current uh, uh, legislation is rather weak uh, in order for us to apply sanctions. I don't think so, because we do have legislation on uh, misleading uh, consumers uh, and the related sanctions. So we will see. Well, we have got predominantly young people in the audience, which is why I'd like to touch up on again or get back to the interest or lack of interest of youngsters. Uh, in 2014, uh, the, the in Scotland, they decreased the age uh, to 14, and now, thanks to Jeremy Corbyn, we see activation amongst young people in the UK, increased membership in Labour Party, more young people that uh, did uh, turn up uh, in uh, elections of all kinds. So what would you say about the change of the age limit or eligibility? 
people age limit. Well, this is a political decision, or matter of a political decision in particular, and that's of course to be decided by the lawgivers or legislative bodies. And I believe that it is highly likely that those who are responsible for that have already concluded that the current generation is far more mature, or far, is mature far earlier, simply, and more, so to say, competent to decide. But I do not think that uh, the change in the age element will have an immediate strong impact if traditionally the younger part of the generation or younger people uh, don't go to the elections or there is a low rate of um, election participation, then I don't think this will change essentially. I would tend to think we have the so-called active and passive right to vote. Well, the active uh, is uh, dependent or preconditioned by the age of 18 years, and the passive is uh, raised to the age of 21. And I don't see why an 18-year-old shouldn't be entitled to being elected apart from uh, the right to vote. Then I would care about the rest. So, Mr. Richosti, Mr. Richoski talked about the, about the majority. That means you become of age or, um, and uh, you are so to say autonomous to decide or I uh, just can't imagine that younger people would decide about the fate of or destiny of the country that is younger than 18. I, I mean it's Mr. Kutsky says but younger people are more, more mature earlier. It's not true. People leave home actually later. We have this helicopter parents education where uh, they, uh, the youngsters are not capable of uh, standing alone or being independent, so I would not suggest to experiment there with. And in the age category 17 plus, we see indifference, lack of interest, so shall we bring it down to 16 plus? And in the UK, where media, so to say, changes, the older ones uh, were in favor of Brexit and the other way round. There was a record low uh, turn up of young generation in this uh, Brexit memorandum, but I didn't say that. No, I'm saying that. So, and, the, you know, the same uh, happened around uh, Bernie Sanders in the US. These are you know, so, which are not um, supported by any statistical data where simply the British would love the uh, Labour Party to be in a power already. Well, in 2017, in the early election or SAP elections, which uh, um, Theresa May actually, uh, well, there was a higher turn up. Well, I mean, as to Brexit, I am convinced that this outcome of Brexit referendum did not express the majority will of the UK citizens to leave. The EU majority in EU was about uh, expressing trust or mistrust uh, to, or vis a vis towards simply the existing uh, establishment. And I believe that uh, those um, levers or those who wanted to, act, uh, to simply favor Brexit wanted to express their mistrust to the establishment, and that was it. The Euro Atlantic civilization is. Um, in crisis right now, and that's the era we've been living in. And there is a massive growth or expansion of people who feel to be underrepresented or not represented by anyone, which is why they very easily believe or trust and follow some of the marginal groups. But that's a, that means, actually, or that's the outcome of the failure of major leading parties. So if uh, we have once again or uh, the uh, which would not be the, so if there is a uh, in the UK, if there is yet again in the Northern Ireland and UK another referendum on whether they want or not to leave the EU, which will not happen, it would not be decent, it would uh, result in uh, their decision to stay. 
But uh, let's uh, leave aside the Brexit debate. We have got a couple of questions about the e- Czech position in the EU. Wojciech is asking as follows. I wonder whether the V4 membership doesn't, so to say, have a negative impact on our um, uh, uh, vision or position or repute in the EU. I believe that being in one group is a pass and Hungarians is no good. Well, I believe the Visegrad for cooperation a label or brand uh, does not only have a positive meaning but also kind of shady uh, use which um, uh, it uh, receives. And that's due to the image of Hungary or rather Hungarian Prime Minister and also to a degree due to the image of Poland. And I'm far, I, I certainly wouldn't put them in one group. I mean, I see major differences between Poland and Hungary. But what we have been trying to achieve or to do, and Vera Jorova can confirm that, so we have been trying to not to simply have this uh, Brussels stereotype, the perception which means Czech Republic means equal service grad for and I would say that at the so to say professional level we have been uh, successful in the in explaining the differences because uh, I believe that we have managed to explain the difference in the internal EU debate but uh, And that's at the political level, we have been less successful, which has been caused by multiple factors, predominantly by the fact that uh, amongst the politicians at all levels, uh, there is a tendency to simplify everything. And that is why the risk of things being perceived as a cliché is much higher than at the professional or expert level. So when I'm to talk about our position or activities in the EU within other institutions and units, etc., I've always done my best to distinguish uh, or differentiate between the political narrative as per such or per se and the content, its content or the substance so, uh, supporting it, which certainly is not always identical with what we see in the public arena space. I'd like to reword the question and uh, address it to Madam Ayurova. Was this um, element of being Czech a kind of, um, you know, stone on your leg or foot? Well, I sometimes quote Hasek, who had always said that it's good uh, for each and everyone to be from a different part of the world. I'm a complainer, I'm, so to say, uh, constantly complaining to things, to several times I criticize these statements by Mr. Juncker, and it's not a heavy ball on your leg or a stone, but uh, I'm, since I'm responsible for justice, human rights, gender equality, all those topics which are troublesome in the East, uh, that is why I'm always looked at with a kind of or a degree of suspicion. And I've been doing my best to cope because I do respect, um, I mean, common sense and honesty or fairness. Well, back to the Czech Republic. It may seem that uh, our image is um, as the Czech Republic being a part and parcel of a V4. About, as Mrs. Lamal and Mr. Povesha said, there are those fluid alliances per topic. So, when it comes to agriculture, we are on a different island as against the island in cohesion policy. And in many economic matters, we, so to say, follow the Hanseatic, Kurt, Germany, Denmark, those um, 
uh, countries um, and migration. When it comes to migration, the Visegrad Four used to stick together, which is perhaps why we are considered, or this grouping is called, considered to be a monolith. And when something happened in Slovakia in the field of justice, then uh, you know we hear, well, that's exactly what we expected you checks to do. Uh, I mean, suggesting that we are faced with problems in certain areas. I have uh, experienced the mentoring enough. That means at the time uh, before the accession during the harmonization of law, I have had enough of that. And um, the Western European MPs should not uh, teach us, shouldn't instruct us or be the mentors. They should go to the country itself and see for themselves. I frequently feel offended, and I usually say so aloud. I articulate my opinion. Well, when we uh, also did a survey about anti-Semitism in the European Union, I had a press conference and the Western media asked always, well, what will you tell us how to deal with the increased anti-Semitism sentiments in Poland and Hungary? I said, well, I mean, did you get this information from, I said, in Germany, France, Sweden, so why do you refer to Poland and Hungary in the East? And I know I'm now talking about a different thing, but in the East, the anti-Semitism lives on old myths and old uh, events are kind of brought back to life. Uh, an Israel-Palestinian conflict moved uh, to the Western Europe, which is the explosive, so to say, or type bomb. And that's where the West should uh, deal with that first and foremost before talking about somebody else. But we also have uh, topics related to values, and there all of us should reach an agreement on the values we wish to support in the future. A minor question, which I believe is for Mr. Uh, Mr. Havel suggested to set up the second chamber of the European Parliament. Would it make sense now still? Well, this idea is derived from the bicameral systems of Parliament simply principle. And the second chamber simply does its best to offset or bring back the balance. Uh, the first chamber uh, usually mirrors the majority or mainstream opinions, majorities, and who is to be the protecting entity of minorities. So France, so Germany, I mean, they uh, have the second chamber, and uh, regardless of the low or high number of representatives, uh, they have the same voice. So the principle as such is very beneficial and very good, but whether or not it would um, work in Europe, with all the councils where each and every member state is represented by one state, so there is equality therein. Well, I don't know. I don't think it is necessary. I believe that it might be better to boost the functioning of um, the council, as whether of individual min branch ministers or sectoral ministers or prime ministers. And I do understand they have they are busy enough back at home, so they delegate and send someone else to represent them in the Brussels. But I believe they should um, be in the Brussels and send. The, the deputy uh, to a delegated deputy to participate in a meeting back at home in the uh, like in Czechoslovakia and uh, the Czech Republic. When Mr. Klaus and the uh, Senate criticized Lisbon uh, uh, Treaty, talking about the restrictions of freedom or sovereignty, we said the very contrary: sovereignty has exceeded the borders. Not only do we have a say in our internal matters, but also into Europe European matters, and that's what our reps in the EU should become aware of. Become aware of. Thank you. I would like to add that the second chamber within the system practically exists, and that's the Council of the European Union. But uh, in majority of cases, uh, what uh, is uh, decided there 
uh, it is not in capas uh, the equity of voices. Uh, so it's uh, uh, weighted according to the number of uh, inhabitants in rural countries. It's a sort of hybrid, half step towards the balance. Uh, with the two-chamber system, but the council is uh, a legislative body, not executive body. Uh, do you want to respond, Lenka? I fully agree with um, Pavel Arichran uh, when he said that uh, we caused the problem uh, for ourselves. And I think the ministers uh, fail in that uh, they do not bring certain very important uh, European topics uh, into our politics. And uh, all then we are all surprised. Uh, but you see, at various uh, councils or ministry, we were able to have an impact. Uh, the e e-vehicles. Uh, so that's a, a debate that is uh, running for really quite some time. And all of a sudden, we really uh, them are surprised that something has been decided and we somehow don't know about it. For instance, another topic, uh, um, sustainable green financing system. Um, so, for instance, if some active members of the previous uh, um, Bank, uh, banking board. Uh, I have never heard uh, uh, about uh, such a topic in the uh, uh, being discussed in Brussels. Uh, so it's the way we f operate, uh, what are the risks, etc. The change in the approach. Uh, it's within this country inside. I think that uh, when it comes to the final users in the Czech Republic, it, is, it means the broad public lack uh, the relevant. Uh, good, high-quality information. And that's the fault of ministers and their deputies, uh, primarily their fault. And what about uh, uh, the involvement of media? Perhaps they are not able to bring such information uh, into their uh, um, into their uh, activities. Uh, well, let me add to what has been said right now. In many cases, um, in majority of cases, um, um, within uh, the discussion in the EU, so we do what is needed and we just work on what is uh, to be worked at. So be it the green financing or CO2 issues, um, um, so the work has been done, but still, we pretend that nothing like that was happened. But this is also a fault of media. So what Ms. Jorova said on anti-Semitism, and you should just focus on such talks more often. And we uh, we said that it is a narrative that is usually presented by the journalists. It's psychophobia. Uh, nobody uh, says that 90 percent of topics are run with the Hansa, and um, somehow it's uh, negative, so let's uh, write about it. But you see, there are two extremes on the two sides, uh, and uh, uh, only few substantive topics are entering the necessary debate. Uh, I'm a veteran of the Czech radio. That. Um, was involved in the creation of the first European program called as Europe Studio. And as I was present in many, many talks, so I know very well that once someone presented the topic containing the term of Brussels, so many editors were against it. And they were opposing such a thing. So I can oppose you that um, your approach was wrong. Uh, you have to say it's about the reform of the car industry. It means that people will have to uh, get rid of this type of cars because it means that and that. Lenka, perhaps uh, we should not pay too much attention to this uh, topic. We will discuss it later. What? type of intonation about uh, the EU activities at various levels uh, uh, are lacking in the Czech Republic most. I would say that uh, inf it is uh, uh, information that have a direct impact on people's lives, uh, and nobody realizes it. While estimates uh, vary, but more than 60 percent uh, of the legislation adopted 
in the Czech Parliament uh, has uh, a strong or weaker imprint of the European legislation or European integration. And this is something that is lacking uh, uh, in information dissemination in the Czech Republic. As in other countries, uh, in my opinion, it is uh, sort of complacent, politically speaking, to hold to maintain certain polarity between us and them. This is what we started with. Uh, because it uh, brings certain political advantages. So the same question to you. What type of information, if you speak uh, amongst uh, the uh, European institutions, uh, what informations are lacking there? Uh, well, these are things that um, concern everyday practical lives of our people. It may be something, something positive in majority of cases, but uh, nobody explained uh, that uh, thanks to uh, us being the member of the EU club. Uh, so we should all realize uh, that we should explain it in a better way without pushing it on people via hard promotions. I spent a vacation in Italy, and um, uh, in my hotel there were several uh, families from the town of Usti nad Laben. And the father just uh, attacked me quite often. But uh, we just talked a lot, and because he said then uh, his son studies uh, via Erasmus program, and um, he has got uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, exports towards other countries of the EU, and we discussed it and we analyzed it, uh, and um, um, in the end of the day, he became a supporter of Europe in Union of the European Union. Well. As to the topic of uh, how politicians sometimes uh, dis do not disclose certain information, you know, uh, the EU legislation uh, contains one particular element, uh, namely that uh, it goes beyond certain things that we need uh, within the Czech Republic. You said it before, our sovereignty went beyond our borders. Uh, we have uh, uh, received something, we have given something, uh, but at the same time, uh, it is also um, containing uh, a large volume of responsibility, it's responsibility that many of us do not understand, uh, uh, which has used uh, certain liberties, and it goes beyond the present time. Uh, you see, we cannot uh, focus on policies uh, that are all only for the present time. It is also to be for the future. We have to explain uh, things uh, that perhaps we do not feel in our everyday lives, uh, in our uh, plates, uh, etc., that things that go beyond our life framework. Uh, well, let's get back to our country. Mr. Richetsky, do you think that uh, the Czechs uh, in relation to the EU are not knowledgeable uh, so that uh, they don't see the full context. I don't like to speak about the national mentality. But still, I think that uh, perhaps due to our past, to our history, uh, Czechs uh, uh, are internally against any institution, any office, uh, not only in local terms, but also uh, in international terms. The Czechs uh, is, uh, are not a nation that would love uh, uh, authorities, uh, perhaps except for uh, the top post of the president, because his position or her position was always uh, uh, at the top. But otherwise, uh, also in the very long past, under the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, the Czechs do not like institutions. And uh, it will be very difficult to overcome this uh, aspect. In simple terms, simple terms I, I don't like to say it, but in uh, the times when I was uh, the uh, 
Deputy Prime Minister, uh, the Federal Czechoslovakia. Uh, it was responsible for the coordination between the Czech and Slovak Prime Ministers. And the Slovak Prime Minister in those days, uh, Jan Czarnogorzy, was the least popular Prime Minister. And so the, the discussion was about Petr Pithard and uh, Jan Czarnogorzy. And um, I uh, thought that if the Czech Prime Minister uh, the Czech Prime Minister was, uh, sorry, the, the Jan Czernosy was most a favorite politician as against Petr Pirhard, the least favorite politician. And uh, uh, to break the Czech mentality, it was very difficult. Uh, there was a lack of confidence uh, for anybody who is at the top hierarchy. And uh, people have to realize that it means all of us uh, are in it. Uh, we should go uh, to the elections. Uh, we should not be quarrelsome only. The Czechs um, are really gruesome only, garrulous, but uh, we should never exaggerate. Uh, well, it was a very nice uh, conclusion, Lenka, perhaps, the last point. Well, this is uh, said by an a representative of an institution that has uh, the highest level of confidence and trust in the society. A lack of confidence, so we are uh, at the top uh, among other countries uh, in Europe. Well, I'm very glad uh, to say that the Czech justice uh, has uh, such a high level of trust, uh, and uh, at the same time, it is also less vulnerable because of that. Well, in conclusion, uh, let me say that uh, basically speaking, uh, we lack respect to authorities. We are a sort of flat type of society. When I was, uh, Václav Halvel uh, said that uh, when I started to have certain influence, so, uh, I became suspicious uh, for myself. Thank you very much, and it was a very nice uh, conclusion for today's panel, number one. And uh, uh, I do trust that uh, Ms. Orova is doing a lot uh, for having high respect for the European uh, Union in general. Thank you. Vera Hovova. Thank you very much. Let me also thank uh, the President of the Constitutional Court uh, of the Czech Republic, Pavel Erichetsky. I also appreciate uh, the presence of my colleague, journalist Lenka Zlamalová, at this panel. And I also thank very much uh, to Martin Povejšil, the Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, for participating in our panel. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a coffee break before us, and then we will resume our work in the afternoon panel number two. Thank you very much.